Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. My name is Christy Mortar, and I'm the Vice Chair of the CTS Infrastructure Research Council, and I work at Hennepin County in the Transportation Operations Department. I will be helping facilitate today's green infrastructure webinar and joint meeting of the CTS um, Transportation Infrastructure Research Council and the Environment and Energy and Transportation Research Council. Our other council chairs are with us today as well. So at this time, I will ask them each to introduce themselves. Doug, do you wanna start? Sure, thank you. Um, Christine, my name's Doug Snyder. I'm the executive director at the Mississippi Watershed Management Organization and also the current chair of the uh, Environment and Energy Research Council. Um, then I'll throw it at, uh, I guess, Mark Maloney. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for everyone for being here. I'm Mark Maloney. I'm the uh, public works director at the city of Shoreview and I am the outgoing chair of the Transportation Infrastructure Research Council. Hi, I'm Katie Kowalczyk and I am the Water Resources Coordinator for the City of Minneapolis and the Vice Chair of the Energy and Environment Council. Thank you. I would also like to share that Gina Bass and Katie Kirk from CTS are here today supporting this event. Just a bit of background on the CTS councils. They provide a forum for transportation professionals and researchers to engage, exchange information on current transportation issues and trends. And then they also bring together university faculty and staff with practitioners from the public and private sector to recommend direction and participate in improving the center's research, education, and engagement programs. Katie Kirk is going to share a link to the council information in the chat if you're interested in learning more about the councils. Today's meeting features a presentation on the practical implementation of green infrastructure strategies and a panel discussion featuring local and state government representatives. Before I introduce our speaker, um, we have a few housekeeping items that Katie will share. All right, thanks, Christy. So today for questions and comments, we'll use the Q&A. Um, please type your questions in there and then we'll hold all the questions until the end of Professor Gulliver's presentation. And then I'll share them with the audience during the Q&A session. Afterwards, we'll have a round robin, and if you'd like to share, um, you can type in the in the chat to share, and we will unmute you so you can ask, you can contribute to the round robin. If you need PDHs or if you need um, AICP credits, please just send in a chat message to all panelists, and we will email that to you after today's event. And then, the last thing to go over is our CTS research conference. Uh, I don't know if uh, we have the slide ready for that one, but right now we are scheduling this for November 4th, 2021 at the Graduate Hotel in Minneapolis. And of course, we hope to be able to gather in person or at least some of us do, but we're going to continue to monitor COVID-19 developments and make a decision as we get closer. So the dates and format of the event may change. And then it, there is currently a call for presentation ideas. There's open until April 26th. If you've completed or participated in innovative research, implementation, or engagement, please submit presentation ideas to share your work at that conference. Katie will add the link to the presentations in the chat. Now I will turn it back over to Christy for an introduction. Thanks, Katie. So today's webinar features presenter John Gulliver from the Department of Civil, Environmental, and Geoengineering at the University of Minnesota. In the presentation, John is planning to review the many positive attributes of green infrastructure. He will also discuss how to overcome the challenges it can present for stormwater management, including infiltration practices, filtration practices, and stormwater ponds. Following the presentation, we've got a dynamic panel featuring local and state government representatives the discussion will focus on lessons learned from
from green infrastructure projects that have been implemented in the areas of design, operations, and maintenance. It will also include state guidance. John Gulliver is a professor of civil environmental and geoengineering at the University of Minnesota, performing his research at the St. Anthony Falls Laboratory. Much of Dr. Gulliver's research involves the Department of New Technology, or sorry, the development of new technology for the treatment of road runoff and assessment of field performance of stormwater treatment practices, including the saffle baffle, the iron enhanced sand filter, and the MPD infiltrometer. In addition, he's a co-author of the book, Optimizing Stormwater Treatment Practices, a handbook for assessment and maintenance. With that, I will turn it over to John. Uh, thank you, Chrissy. Um, I was asked to give this presentation uh, and I thought, well, heck, I can talk about anything I want to, it's pretty broad. And then I started thinking about how broad it was and realized that we need a pretty good introduction to talk about the different issues. Uh, and so I'll start off with that. And, and then I'll narrow in on the specialty that I find interesting. Oh. Having difficulty here. There we are, sorry. So the first three items are an introduction. We'll talk about the impact of impervious runoff, and then we'll talk about the evolution of stormwater terminology because it's been changing over time. Hopefully we've reached some sort of equilibrium. Uh, and then we'll talk about the definitions, plural, of green infrastructure. That's the topic for today. Uh, and then we'll move into the benefits, challenges, and solutions of infiltration, of filtration, and the benefits, challenges, and risk factors, not necessarily solutions yet, of pond storage. And we'll finish with some take-home messages. So the impact of impervious runoff. Most of the urban runoff comes from impervious surfaces. I like this um, graphic put together by Dr. Uh, May from the University of Washington. Um, he talks about forested land cover and urbanized land cover, the difference between them. Here on the left, we have forested land cover. On the right, urbanized land cover. The main cover, the main difference between them is the surface runoff. In forested land cover, you only have 0.3% typically of the rainfall that falls ends up as runoff. That's not true in urbanized land cover. In an urban, urbanized land cover, he calculated through uh, simulations that it's 30%. Now, it may not be, that's a factor of 100 difference. Whether it's a factor of 100 or a factor of 10, there's still a lot of runoff in an urbanized land, uh, land cover. So here's a hydrograph of our runoff. We have runoff versus time. Uh, and the pre-development, you can see we have this curve right down here. This is a pretty big storm because you actually have some runoff before development. That would be you know, forests, um, prairies, wetlands, things like that. Well, post-development, you have an earlier peak. You have a lot more water. Uh, and um, it just it is just very different. Here's the factor of 100 in the area underneath each of these curves, where there's, it could be a factor of 10 or a factor of 100. Another impact of impervious runoff is that runoff contains wash-off pollutants, nutrients from leaves, grass clippings, tree flowers, uh, metals that come from cars, such as copper, zinc, chromium, and lead, and petroleum hydrocarbons. Here's an example of one of these uh, water quality impacts. This is the uh, cyanobacteria, creates uh, harmful al algal blooms that kill the fish, get your dog sick, and makes your lake or your pond look kind of ugly. A third impact of impervious runoff is increased stream bank erosion. Because of the high flows that you have coming in from impervious runoff, you get a lot of erosion on the stream bank. So if you start with a less than 5% urban, 5% uh, impervious cover, you have a fairly natural stream. At eight to 
uh, it becomes uh, it starts to look a little bit different. It starts to uh, meander and you start to have some bank erosion. At 30%, it looks something like this. First off, you have less base flow because you don't have groundwater flow anymore. Less, you have less groundwater flow. And so there's less flow coming in from the, from the bottom and from the sides. And in addition, you have the high flows that come into the stream during the storms uh, creates a lot of erosion around the, on the banks. A fourth impact is combined sewer overflows. This is overflows coming out of a manhole. Underneath that, you have a sump and a storm sewer coming out of the manhole, and that is combined sewer. That means it's sanitary sewer and a storm sewer. Not very pleasant to walk around in, to have your car drive in, to have in your basement. In Minnesota, we're lucky that we do not have many combined sewer overflows because we spent a lot of money in the 60s separating our storm sewers from our sanitary sewers. But some places really have a problem with combined sewer overflows and they're worried about bacteria uh, getting into the uh, water, uh, into the receiving water body and creating things like cholera. A fourth impact is flooding during extreme events. The 10 year storm, the 25 year storm, the 100 year storm, we've had a couple of thousand year storms in Minnesota lately. Uh, flooding during uh, extreme events, uh, it, infiltration actually helps quite a bit in flooding during an extreme event. Even though you have runoff from pervious surfaces, a lot of the water that falls ends up in the ground uh, and the impervious surface just will send it right to the storm sewers, right to the receiving water body. So those, these are five impacts of impervious, impervious runoff. <clears throat> So I'd like to move on to the evolution of stormwater terminology. This is kind of an interesting topic. This is only in the United States. Stormwater is very, uh, very local. Uh, and so at least it's, it's to date, it's been local. The terminology is local. In the United States, we first started off with stormwater best management practices or BMPs. That's all infrastructure used to treat the quantity and quality of stormwater. In the 90s, low impact development became popular. That's where you try and get back to the, um, uh, to the pre-development hydrograph through infiltration and evapotranspiration. Um, the National Academy decided that BMP was not a really good term because the best management practice is a business term. There are best management practices everywhere. Um, best management practices to run a business to run an economy, all these types of things. And so the National Academy decided it wasn't appropriate. So they came up with their own term, stormwater control measures. Many academic papers that you see will talk about stormwater control measures instead of BMPs, they are virtually identical. Uh, and now we get down to green infrastructure. It started with stormwater. The, I think it was the EPA who started it. Uh, but currently, it is an ecological framework, more broadly, it's an ecological framework for social, economic, and environmental health. That's a pretty broad term. And so people have recognized <laughs> that um, green infrastructure is much broader than stormwater. And so we, we start talking about green stormwater infrastructure. That term is starting to come up just recently. So the US EPA's definition of green infrastructure, like I said, they, they, I think that they started the term on green infrastructure, either that or they picked it up quickly. Uh, it's all about stormwater volume control. Uh, so that means you want to infiltrate, evapotranspirate, and reduce flows to sewer systems uh, or to uh, some sort of surface water. That's only a portion of the ecological framework for social, economic, and environmental health. And I, we have a different definition, and this is starting to become, um, starting to become uh, developing into, into the stormwater area, and that would be a green to gray continuum in stormwater infrastructure. Um, Vinny Taguchi is a PhD student. He was the first author on a paper published recently. He set up a definition of green and gray stormwater and the continuum between green and gray. And he started off with the two extremes, natural areas that'd be intact forests, wetlands, prairies, on one extreme, on the other extreme, uh, storm sewers. And in between we have 
our stormwater BMPs. He thought about, well, what makes, what, what, what gets us closest to a natural area? The closest thing we have to a natural area is a pond or a wetland because you provide habitat. Habitat for birds, habitat for animals, habitat for waterfowl, which are birds. Next to that would be rain gardens. Uh, rain gardens are still vegetated, still a good idea, but um, they aren't large enough to be a really good habitat for wildlife. So that's why they're next. Third comes filtration and infiltration basins. They do a good job of filtering or infiltrating water, but they are grass typically. And so they don't provide any habitat to speak of. They're grass so that you can mow the grass um, and they're next in line. Then comes temporary flood storage. That would be for dry ponds. They don't provide much infiltration. They don't provide much filtration. They just store the water. And finally, to the, far, to the right of the BMPs comes storm, uh, underground storage. Now that includes uh, filtration ba uh, basins, infiltration basins, storage basins, and I believe um, permeable pavement. So this is a concept that's been uh, developing and we're not the first to develop it, but I think that this is what it looks like for the green to gray continuum with regard to uh, green infrastructure. So now we'll move to some of the benefits, challenges and solutions. In this case, infiltration. Infiltration is a good thing for stormwater. You have a tremendous volume reduction. A high percent of the water quality storm can be infiltrated the water quality storm in Minnesota is one inch. You can, in many places, because of a conservative design, can actually infiltrate a two inch storm. And if the rain comes slowly, if it doesn't come down all at once, you can infiltrate a three inch or greater storm. So there's a lot of benefits to infiltration. You have reduced peak flow. You filter uh, through, uh, by putting it through the soil to remove solids, bacteria, phosphorus, metals associated with these solids. Uh, and so that has a water quality function. You control temperature through groundwater recharge. Uh, and that's important for trout streams. And then finally, you increase the base flow in streams and you reduce the peak flow. So the MPCA recommends infiltration. And these are my terms uh, when reasonable. Uh, Mike Trojan might, might explain what that means or tell me I'm totally wrong. I don't know. We'll, we'll find out. So this is, what we're, this is what we're doing with regard to our runoff hydrograph. Uh, our runoff is here on the left and time on the bottom. Again, here's our uh, pre-development curve, the green curve. The orange curve is our post-development curve. If we put in a whole bunch of ponds and things like that, we can reduce the peak, but the volume stays the same. So we take this curve to the orange curve and we get that curve with the dots. If we have intensive infiltration, we can get down to the pre-development curve. That's a lot of infil infiltration practices. Here are the infiltration practices. Uh, we have infiltration basins, uh, underground infiltration chambers, um, bio infiltration practices. Uh, these are basically rain gardens that infiltrate the water and swales. We also have infiltration trenches, tree trenches and permeable pavement. There are challenges to infiltration. The first is that you can pollute the groundwater because we're putting so much sodium chloride on our streets in the wintertime. You can, if you infiltrate some of that runoff, uh, you can pollute the groundwater. And in Minnesota, we have problems with chloride pollution. All the red dots and the red lines here are impaired streams and impa impaired uh, lakes impaired for chloride. And some of these streams are impaired for concentrations all around the year, throughout the year. That means it's groundwater that's causing that impairment. And it's going to increase and we have to solve this somehow. The only solution is um, source reduction. Uh, nitrates are not a big problem with regard to urban runoff but they are a problem, for example, if you're underneath um, a feedlot, that would be a huge problem. 
for urban runoff, I don't see nine treats as being a, a big problem, at least in the, in the Midwest. <clears throat> Another challenge to infiltration, failure to infiltrate. From day one, 30% roughly of the practices fail on day one. Now that's a 30% that's a failure rate is huge. The reason for that is because of the high spatial variability of the soil. If you take a, an infiltration measurement, for example, or a soil profile at one location, that may not tell you what the whole practice is going to do. You need to get enough data in that practice in terms of infiltration measurements or in terms of soil profiles to tell you what the whole practice will do. We'll talk about that in a little bit. You need expertise in soil profiling and uh, you, you also have a different kind of excavation and grading and different kind of construction from a normal construction project. So roughly 30% of the practices fail. Now, if you're in a sand plane, but you might do better than 30%. You might do 85, 90%. Uh, I'm sorry, you might do 10% uh, to 15%. Uh, I reverse that. 85 to 95% successful. But if you're in Southwest Minnesota, where they don't have good soils, you need to be pretty careful about where you put in an infiltration basin. And you could have 50% failure. So the last challenge that I've got for infiltration is the clogging of the pores. Now clogging of pores is important when it comes to permeable pavement like we have here or underground infiltration chambers. I don't think it's a big deal when the plants, when the plants are present because the plants keep the pores open. The plants open up the soil. They have to because they have to get water down to the roots. Think about it. How's a plant gonna get water to its roots? Well, it's gotta keep that soil open. Otherwise it's a dead plant. So if you have plants, though the pores will probably be open and you won't have to uh, do anything with the soil. That, that helps quite a bit for inspections and things like that. So here's one partial solution to the failure to infiltrate. We found in our uh, analysis that you need multiple infiltration measurements to characterize the infiltration rate of a stormwater BMP. If you want to be within a factor of three in terms of infiltration rate, that's a factor of three, you need 10 measurements. This is, this is for all kinds of things, for um, rain gardens with engineered soil, for swales, for uh, parks, you need, to, you need at least 10 measurements to be within a factor of three. You need 20 measurements to be within a factor of two. So we developed the modified fillet done infiltrometer. That's, uh, this is with my co-PI, uh, John Niebuhr, uh, and two students, Rebecca Nestingen and Brooke Aslison. Uh, we did this uh, because we needed something that was relatively quick. It does not require that much water and it's easy to install. It's only, uh, uh, what is it, uh, only 10 centimeters wide, four inches wide. So this is, now it's a licensed upstream technology. So this is the device that they're selling, uh, the modified Philip Dunn infiltrometer. Uh, these, these two here are to, uh, the thing on the far left, these are just to get it installed. This is a soil moisture meter and this over here on the far right is to carry it. We got out and we took some measurements. Uh, this is for bioinfiltration practices or rain gardens that infiltrate water into the soil. What we don't want is in the top here. Uh, we don't want a, a rain garden that after 48 hours, 72 hours is full of water. And you can re tell that it, that is full of water all the time because there are no plants in it. No plants are growing because plants don't grow underneath a whole bunch of water. Uh, not when it's full for 72 hours. What we do want is something like this at the bottom. Okay. So we went out and took some measurements. Uh, this is about 40 measurements. Uh, in a rain garden on the St. Paul campus. You can see the size of the uh, circles indicates the saturated hydraulic conductivity, which is the saturated infiltration rate. And uh, what we found, at least for this rain garden, is that the, there are locations in the center that are not infiltrating that well and locations on the edge that are infiltrating well. 
It could be uh, clogging of the pores. This was not really full at the time of plants, but it also could be the problem with construction. But we found this rain garden was still infiltrating well. The meeting infiltration rate was high. And so we decided that was a good rain garden. We did this at six rain gardens. And you can, here is the saturated hydraulic conductivity versus the cumulative distribution versus the, um, yeah, the cumulative distribution of saturated hydraulic conductivity. <clears throat> so the one, what we just looked at was a St. Paul rain garden, that's the diamonds here. And it has two orders of magnitude difference. That's a factor of a hundred difference between the quickest uh, the highest value of your saturated hydraulic conductivity and the lowest value. That's a big difference. That's a factor of 100. Now, if you take a look at uh, Thompson, Thompson Lake Rain Garden, it's huge. We have one, two, three, four, five orders of magnitude difference between uh, the, the, high, the fastest infiltration rate and the slowest infiltration rate in this rain garden with engineered soil. The reason is because of compaction and because of the plants. The plants open it up, compaction closes it. And so you can make have a heck of a difference in terms of your saturated hydraulic conductivity. We also measured infiltration in MnDOT drainage ditches. And the first thing I did is I tried to figure out, these were called drainage ditches. I tried to figure out, well, what's the difference between a drainage ditch and a grass swale? So I looked up definitions. I looked up three different definitions and drainage ditches drain water and also infiltrate water. And they're covered with grass. Grass swales infiltrate water, are covered with grass, of course, but they also drain the water that is in excess. So I could not make any difference between them. I could not understand there, that there's any difference. We started calling drainage ditches grass swales. <clears throat> I did this work with, with John Niebuhr and um, three uh, PhD students. Funding is from MnDOT and Local Road Research Board. MnDOT comes up with some fairly detailed design specifications, 12 inches of topsoil with 20% grade two compost. Um, that's Min, uh, MnDOT grade two. And they allow for plant growth with deep rooted grasses. These swales are all successful at infiltrating water. The only place in the place they weren't successful is where groundwater was high. Um, and the reason is you can't infiltrate when you have high groundwater, it just doesn't work. And you could identify those places by looking at the types of plants that grew there. If you had cattails, then probably you're not gonna do a very good job of infiltrating because the groundwater is high. But the main reason that they all infiltrated well was the plants. And if you have plants, then you have minimal maintenance because you just have to mow the lawn and uh, clean up the trash. Now here's our a couple uh, uh, pictures of our infiltrometers. This is an early infiltrometer. You can see we have one, two, three, four. We have actually have 20 of them out at a time. And here they have 10 infiltrometers, fairly intense area they're doing right here. We took 104 measurements in two days uh, at, uh, at this site right here. So it is possible to get out. Well, of course, we had a crew of five. It is possible to get out with a crew of three to five uh, and take a lot of measurements. <clears throat> so this is like one example of our work on swales. Uh, what this illustrates is the influence of plants. We determined the hydrologic soil group. That's the NRCS um, classification <clears throat> for infiltration. And they have uh, classifications from A to D. A is a good soil, that's a sand, a sandy loam or loamy sand. D is a, is a poor soil for infiltration, that's a clay or, or a very, very, or a silt clay or something like that. So we did particle size distributions to determine uh, what sort of soil texture we had. And here's the soil textures. Uh, and these soil textures correspond to these hydrologic soil groups. Usually you take the lowest soil texture in which you find because that will be the limiting uh, layer. <clears throat> and so here we have uh, something that's limited B, A, A, and then down at the bottom here, C. We measured the saturated hydraulic conductivity with the modified Philip Dunn infiltrometer. 
And these values were all high, 3.5 centimeters per hour, 5.7, 3.5, and 4.1. These are all in the A classification for hydrologic soil group. The reason, I believe, is the influence of plants. The plants kept these soils into HSGA. The other thing that you can see in terms of the influence of plants is the porosity. Soil typically has a porosity of about, a maximum porosity, depends on the soil, of about 45%. Even a sandy soil has a maximum porosity of about 45%. We had 50, up to 58% porosity. That's because the plants open this soil up so that there is plenty of room for water to drain in. So that's the influence of plants. In terms of infiltration, I just love plants. So let's talk about infiltration practices, about filtration practices. What are the benefits of filtration practice? Well, the benefits are much fewer than infiltration practices. And that's why MPCA and other um, regulators really prefer infiltration. Filtration practices will filter the water to improve water quality by filtering out the particles. The challenges, well, one, it doesn't have all the multiple benefits of infiltration. That's not a challenge, that's a fact. Two, it does not remove, filtration practices do not remove dissolved contaminants like phosphate. And phosphate is a huge contaminant because it's a primary uh, cause of harmful algal blooms. In addition, these dissolved contaminants are about 40 to 45% of the pollutants. In other words, you have particulate pollutants, they're roughly 55%, and dissolved pollutants, they're 45%. Filtering the water only takes out most of the 55%, but not the 45%, about the same, and this is not even touched. So a partial solution for phosphate retention is the iron enhanced sand filter. Uh, it's made to remove phosphate. That's five to 10% iron filings, 95 to 90% sand. The iron filings get oxidized. They basically rust and they capture the phosphate. They do an extremely good job of capturing the phosphate if you have uh, iron enhanced sand filter that is well designed and maintained. The collaborator, my collaborators here are Pete Weiss and Andy Erickson, and our funding, the original funding, came from the Local Road Research Board. Here is a, an example of an iron enhanced sand filter. You fill it with water, it flows through the iron enhanced sand into, a, uh, into some drain tile, um, and then flows out. On the bottom, we have a concept which we have studied with prototypes, but I haven't really seen in practice. And that's where you have a, a rain garden, which is growing plants, and you have a compost amended sand on the top, iron enhanced sand in the middle, and then a gravel sub base to get the water from the iron enhanced sand into the under drain. Example IESF applications. Well, the first one was built by Bar, was designed by Bar Engineering. So they have this beautiful basin. Uh, with this aesthetic uh, Stonehenge effect. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's gorgeous. And we put that in every presentation that we make on iron hand sand filters. Thank you very much, uh, Bar Engineering. Uh, uh, but also, uh, this is a, a probably more common. Ross Bittner came up with the idea of putting one of these on the end of a pond. So this is a pond here. And he put it in the, uh, on the edge of the pond. And so when the pond rises, when you have a storm, the pond goes, the pond increases in elevation, the water leaves through the iron enhanced sand filter. So in addition to settling the particles, which is what you're doing in the pond, you're also treating the water that leaves the pond to remove phosphate. So this is the iron enhanced sand filter next to a pond. Uh, and then this is the, the prototypes for the, <clears throat> Uh, the bioretention facility that we hope to uh, have built someplace. And there are currently 170 IESF installations in the country, most of them in Minnesota. So I'll move on to the benefits of stormwater ponds. Uh, I've been working on ponds for a little bit of time. Um, ponds settle particles and associated pollutants. 
and they water these are called water quality ponds right and that's because they settle the particles and the pollutants that are associated with those particles they can also convert phosphate to particulate phosphorus basically through the algae and the plants mostly it's, it's algae that take phosphate they grab that phosphate and turn it into cells they provide wildlife habitat and they are considered by many to be an amenity in urban neighborhoods. The challenge is that we actually need to maintain these things. We haven't been really doing a very good job of maintenance. Uh, and so we need to start investigating them because they've been around a while and some of them don't work as well as we think they do. They're also expensive to dredge. Take a look at these ponds. Can you imagine getting a dredge out in the middle of those ponds? It's difficult to get a dredge out in the middle of those ponds and they aren't really designed to be dredged that well. So people typically will dredge the, in, the, uh, the inlet where the sands all fall out because they can't get any water in anymore, but they won't dredge the entire pond. So the Riley Purgatory Bluff Creek Watershed District um, came to me a few years back and they had some interesting uh, data on total phosphorus, that's TP, for 98 ponds. This is a tremendous set of data. These are the 98, the total phosphorus in each of the 98 ponds. And we took the data and we analyzed it and we found that 32% of them had total phosphorus concentrations that were above the 95 97.5% of inflow concentrations. So a normal inflow concentration is about uh, 0.2 milligrams per liter. Uh, 0.38 is the 95% confidence interval of the, the data of what's coming in. And the ponds came out quite a bit higher than that. Now a pond should be reducing the phosphorus, not increasing the phosphorus. So the ponds are in some ponds are, are reducing the phosphorus, but some are increasing the phosphorus. Why is that? We took a look at it and we decided it has to be internal phosphorus loading, phosphorus release from the sediments. The problem is that these processes that affect phosphorus retention are, I, I don't like to use this word, but I will in terms of the ponds, complex. You have watershed inputs, tree canopy, which turns out is really important. You have sheltering, wind sheltering. Um, you have aquatic vegetation, internal processes like stratification and mixing versus mixing and aeration. In the sediment, you have sediment characteristics that are interacting. And you also have groundwater inter interaction. And what you really have in terms of phosphorus is internal, sometimes internal phosphorus loading. When the DO goes to zero, you start uh, having phosphorus released from the sediments. And we believe that's what's happening in these ponds. So my co-PI is uh, Jacques Finlay. He's working on lakes. He's a, uh, an ecologist, been working on lakes for a long time. Brings a lot to this project. Uh, ben Janke, uh, Pornima, Natarajan, Vini Taguchi, and Paliza Sharitha are the uh, research associates and graduate students working on this. We have funding from a lot of places. Uh, MPCA, Minnesota Stormwater Research Council, uh, Riley Purgatory Bluff Creek Watershed District, Ramsey Washington Metro Watershed District, and the Local Road Research Board, and other uh, research sources. So you'd think we'd have this solved by now with all this research that we've been doing. The problem is that ponds are, like I said, complex. And so all we've done so far is to identify what's going on. So we have research discoveries. The first is that ponds are highly stratified, stratified within a foot of the surface. Most lakes stratify at 15 feet of depth. So you have 15 feet of mixed layer on top of, uh, on top of your uh, thermocline. Ponds are stratified within the first foot. They're only six feet to three feet deep. And so everyone said that these are these are, should be well mixed. They are not well mixed, especially when you have sheltering around the outside. Low oxygen results in sediment phosphate release. So you have low oxygen on the bottom. You might have high oxygen on the top, but yes, it's stratified with regard to temperature. And that means it's stratified with regard to oxygen as well. 
Uh, and our third discovery is that the pond hydrology can affect phosphate re phosphorus retention. So these are the first one is wind sheltering. When we started off, we had this pond to the right. You build a pond, uh, uh, you have some grasses around it. it. It looks something like that, huh? But then after 30 to 40 years, it looks like the pond to the left. It's really well sheltered. It's not that big. And the wind just goes right over the top of that shelter and goes right over the top of the pond. And it doesn't really get down and provide shear on the surface of the pond. So uh, we had a wind mixing frequency versus mean canopy. That's a, the higher mean canopy uh, results in less frequent mixing. And that's one discovery that we uh, uh, have in this research. We also documented phosphate release due to low DO at the bottom. If you have low DO, how much phosphate comes out? How quickly does it come out? And that depends upon the chemistry of the sediments um, and the frequency of low DO, how often you have low DO. Uh, most ponds, uh, many ponds, I shouldn't say most, many ponds have low DO up to 85% of the year. That means most of the year. And they only have high DO, at the, this is at the bottom. They only have high DO during the fall. They have one turnover in the fall. In the uh, spring, they're stratified because of uh, chloride stratification. In the summer, they're stratified because of temperature stratification. So they only have one turnover per year and that's in the fall. Otherwise they're stratified and they have virtually zero DO at the bottom. But there's a, a good side to this research. And that is that we found that pond hydrology is important. Some ponds have a, a low, uh, low retention that makes them high risk. Now, what does low retention mean? That means the water stays at one level. It stays at the, uh, at the, at the level that the outlet, outlet sets for it. When they have a storm come in, that storm moves through the pond and goes right to the outlet. Um, it flushes out the pond and things like that. But there are ponds, and that's the reason they have that is because they have a clay lining at the bottom. So the clay holds the water in there. There are ponds that either do not have a very good clay lining, they, it wasn't constructed well or something's happened to it, or they don't have any clay lining at all. And that would be a high retention pond, what we're, what we're calling a high retention pond, like the one at the bottom here. You can see the water level drops below the level at which would be with outlet control. So that means it's up to a centimeter per day. So you have a centimeter per day drop in the water level that has to fill up before you start having water leaving the pond. So it only leaves the pond in really big storms. Uh, that means you're retaining more phosphorus and more chemicals in your pond. So that's a good thing that came out of this in terms of pond uh, risk factors. So some take home messages. Infiltration has many benefits. There are quite a few of them, volume reduction, reduced peak flow, filtration through the soil, water quality benefit, temperature control, increased space flow and stream. It has challenges. It can pollute the groundwater and you can build a, a infiltration facility and it does not infiltrate water from day one. That is a significant problem. That's an embarrassing problem, right? Uh, it needs a different expertise in soil profiling, but plants help to infiltrate and will reduce the maintenance. A couple of other take home messages. Filtration is very good at retaining particles, but you need to add, have additives like iron filings to um, retain in the, in the media dissolved contaminants. In addition, we need to look after our stormwater ponds. We've ignored them for so many years, just cleaned up the trash around the outside, cut the grass. Many of them didn't cut the grass, so they have trees growing all over uh, the outside. And they are now stratified, and many of them that are stratified are releasing phosphate. Wind sheltering results in more stratified day, five days, and solutions are currently being researched. We're currently looking into solutions for this problem. But these systems are complex. So solutions will take time and effort. So what questions can I answer? Thank you. Thank you so much, Thanks, John. Chad. That was 
Okay. Sorry, go ahead, Christy. Oh, just thanks, John and Katie. Did you want to facilitate the Q and A? Yeah, so we do have some audience questions here, and I will start at the top. Uh, we have a question about how the one inch is measured. So this is kind of early on in your presentation, John, about is that one inch of runoff calculated based on the developed site. Um, exactly sure uh, that question. Yeah, just... the, the, the one inch is uh, specified for Minnesota in the Minnesota Stormwater Manual, one inch of, of runoff uh, or one inch of rainfall. I'm actually not sure. Sorry, but um, uh, Mike Trojan might be able to give you an answer because he's on the panel discussion a little bit later. Okay. And I think some of these might be good questions for Mike, but I will run through them and you can feel free to defer to him as you see fit. So the next question we have is kind of a little bit of a comment, but just the green to gray continuum, that slide that you had about your definition of green infrastructure and how it how it fits on that. How do wetlands and ponds, oops, how do wetlands and ponds compare? And I think you had those on there. They were pretty far on the green side, right? Uh, they were both on the green side. I didn't differentiate between them. Um, I, I think wetlands would be better for uh, be close to a natural system than ponds would um, because waterfowl can still use the wetland. <clears throat> and actually we're discovering the difference between wetlands and ponds is pretty minimal because many ponds have wetland plants in them um, on the edges of the wetland. And wetlands have a deep area where they have open water. So which one is a wetland and which one is a pond? Hmm. Uh, in Minnesota, we cannot make that differentiation. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I found it very interesting that, you know, especially at the end of your slide, the takeaways, the maintenance was much more about the ponds than some of the other facilities that we have. Mm -hmm. But I will get back to audience questions. And the next one we have is about chlorides. And I think this is another thing we're all really grappling with. With all the grass drainage ditches that we have, are we infiltrating chlorides? And is this um, is this a problem or is it more? And I guess I have a follow up question to that too. In the do are, are we seeing anything about reducing chlorides from stormwater BMPs? As far as I know, we we haven't really seen anything. But I'm curious to see if you've heard about anything in research. Uh, thanks for that question, uh, Robert. Uh, yeah, chloride. It doesn't stick to anything. BMPs do nothing with regard to chloride. Chloride goes right through them. Uh, it will, they will retain to a certain extent, especially soil will retain chloride. So we have a certain amount of chloride that is sitting in the soil. Our soil is full of chloride right now. If you go down a certain depth uh, in Minnesota next to a road where the, where the, um, the plows have pushed off the, um, the snow, if you go down a certain depth, you'll find chloride in that soil right now, even though it's been flushed quite a bit. Um, but the only solution is to basically either dilution. Dilution is a solution. If you have the Mississippi River, for example, and you're putting your stormwater in the Mississippi River, chloride in the Mississippi River is pretty low because you've got that quantity of um, flow coming in. And so it doesn't really have an impact on the chloride concentration and it's not close to being uh, a, a problem. But if you have a little stream, then uh, dilution cannot be a solution to that stream because it's primarily groundwater fred. And so then you have to go with source reduction. That means you have to find a different type of de-icer or anti-icer than uh, a chloride-based salt. Hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, all right. I think our next one is maybe a two-part question. Has wind-driven aeration been tied to mix pond, had tried to mix ponds, and then by active aeration, he means with a wind-driven rotor or pump? Um, a aeration in ponds is, um, Actually, to aerate a pond is fairly expensive to really do a good job of it. 
Uh, we are investigating that rock right now to see how much it costs to do a good job of aerating ponds. But I don't see that as being a real good solution. The reason is the ponds are so shallow. You only have six feet of water, sometimes three feet of water. How, how, much, how much of an area are you going to influence with your aerator that's just got this little three feet of water on top of it? You're just gonna influence that local area. And so you're gonna aerate a small area. You're not gonna aerate a whole pond with one aerator. So suddenly you start looking at things that look like activated sludge systems where you have aerators set, set up throughout the pond. That gets expensive and it's really not a good solution. Okay, still on ponds, how long would it would have a pond have to be anoxic before dissolved phosphorus is released? Oh, oh yeah, it's quick. It depends upon it depends upon the sediment oxygen demand of the sediments, and to a certain extent the depth of the pond. But we have had it go uh, anoxic in two days, uh, in other in other cases uh, a week, and in some cases um, fifteen days. But it, in some in some cases when you have high organics in the pond, and most of these ponds have high organics in them, um, it's happened in two days. Okay. We are definitely not getting out there every two days to maintain things here. So the next one we have is about the MPD infiltrometer. Do you have a rule of thumb for minimum number of tests per square foot of an infiltration basin? They design lots of smaller systems ranging between 100 and 2,500 square feet in urban conditions. Yeah, uh, thanks for that question, Rich. We've thought about this quite a bit. And the, the as long as you have the same type of soil throughout the basin, you need the same number of tests because you need statistics. Uh, if you have a larger infiltration basin and the soil changes, then you need two sets of, let's say, 10 to 20 measurements. But if the soil doesn't change, I feel that you can get by with 20 measurements and uh, still be within a factor of two. And that's because, um, uh, and that's because the variations are so huge that the small deviations that, that might happen with, uh, with distance are just not that important. The local variations are just so big. I hope that answers your question, Rich. All right, the next one is about, we're still on infiltration here, regarding the infiltration enhancement due to plants. Have you investigated heavier soils like clay loams or clays? And if so, what did you find? Um, if, uh, <laughs> uh, you we have invested a uh, silty clay loam that had a very low infiltration rate and no plant roots. Um, so if the plants don't get into the, cannot get into the, uh, uh, into the soil like a clay, uh, then you're not gonna get much infiltration. So the plants can't get through those clays either, huh? Oh, no, they can't get into a clay. Uh, you'll find almost no roots in a clay. All right, if the groundwater is deeper, so the flow path is longer from a swale or bio infiltration facility, does that help with a chloride or nitrate? Um, okay, thank you for that. Uh, it's an anonymous attendee. Um, not much for chloride, although there, as I mentioned, there is storage of chloride in the soil. So you got, have more storage depth because chloride gets into the, into the capillaries of the soil and those capillaries don't move out too quickly. You can't, you can't really dry them out that easily. Uh, nitrates may be a little bit, not much. So most, for the most part, both of them move through the soil, even if it's a uh, uh, large depth or small depth. The only difference would be the ability to store the chemicals in the uh, pores um, especially the capillary pores. Okay. All right, our next question is about iron enhanced filters. Has there been research to perform to analyze how long the iron enhanced filter will remain charged? Uh -huh. How often will it need to be maintained? Thank you for that question, George. Uh, we have done a little, just a touch of analysis 
on how long uh, iron enhanced sand filter will last. Uh, and our very limited analysis indicates that it doesn't depend upon the quantity of phosphorus that's in um, the stormwater runoff. It, what it depends upon is the quantity of water that you put through the iron enhanced sand filter. And the reason is probably because there are only so many pores, uh, on, only so many adsorption sites, and there are other chemicals that are interacting that have much higher concentration uh, than uh, uh, phosphate. And so basically the pores get filled up after a certain length of time, and then you have to wait for more iron to rust to oxidize uh, to develop those pores. Um, it's roughly, very roughly, my feeling is, is that about 400 meters of water through a sand filter and your uh, efficiency will go down. Whatever it takes to get 400 meters of water through that sand filter. Is there a way to tell other than with collecting samples of influent and effluent? No, no. Uh, we, we have a, a proposal out to do, uh, to analyze these 170 uh, iron enhanced sand filters but it hasn't been funded. So we keep trying, keep pushing for it because I think it's an important uh, thing to do. All right, we're back on ponds for our next question. What happens if you aerate the bottom of the pond to reduce DO, solved oxygen? Oh, uh, if you aerate the bottom and don't resuspend the sediments, uh, then that, that could do it. Um, the question is, how do you aerate the bottom of the pond, uh, and that's that's where the uh, that's where the rubber hits the road. How do you do it, and how expensive is it? All right. Next question. Great point on plants combating clogging issues in infiltration systems. Do you think there is a depth within the engineered soil at which there are not enough roots to counter clogging and compaction issues that could lead to decreased infiltration? Um, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, yes, there is. Uh, and the question is, uh, how deep, how, how much water do you want your uh, infiltration practice to infiltrate? Um, if you eventually you'll find a point at which um, particles will clog it. Um, but how deep is that? And what happens to the particles before they get there? Um, and that's a, actually a tough question. I haven't really thought about that question much. All right, so we also have a link to a white paper on chlorides that I think we can move over to the chat so everybody can see it. I'm not sure if everybody can see the q and I assume you can, but we can move that as well. And then Let's see here. Our next question is the wetland pond differentiation would depend greatly on water depth. Is that right? And then emergent plants have a maximum depth in which they will grow. Also verifying that. Yeah, um, uh, thank you for that, David. Uh, different plants have different maximum depths at which they'll grow. Um, and the, the, def the definition of a wetland versus a pond, <laughs> we, we went through this recently and um, uh, we just couldn't make a difference. Uh, we couldn't. We, we couldn't tell the difference uh, in terms of the definitions. Um, but they do have a maximum depth in which they'll grow. That's correct. All right. I think David is still asking about what the one inch of runoff, and I'm not sure what the additional question is. So, David, I don't know if you can. I I don't. I didn't understand the question. Apparently. Yes, I don't know if David could help clarify, but asking again what, what defines one inch, and I think we are going to defer to Mike Trojan maybe during the panel on that. So mm -hmm. if that works, I think we can keep moving to the next question. Do you expect to see major revisions to stormwater manuals for pond or infiltration design as a result of the research? Well, that's not, uh, that's not my business, but uh, I'd like to see what we do going to uh, uh, stormwater manuals. Uh, the Minnesota Stormwater Manual is a pretty successful manual in recent years, uh, especially since they went to the wiki 
It's updated continuously. Uh, and um, we have a good relationship with the people at the MPCA. So I imagine that some of it will eventually end up in the stormwater manual. All right, so our next question is, do you recommend attempting to grow plants in an iron, in an iron hand sand filter? Could you speak a little bit about the benefits that roots may have for a filtration rate versus maintenance headaches trying to till media with plants? And I guess beyond in iron and hand sand filters, you know, you'd kind of mentioned for infiltration and filtration practices that we usually just put grass in, would there be benefits in putting in something with deeper roots for those as well? Um, well, uh, I can answer the one about uh, plants and the uh, iron and hand sand filter because Andy Erickson has a project right now working on plants in the iron and hand sand filter. And we've he has found that the plants do not grow nearly as well in the iron and hand sand filter as they do in um, a, a rain garden, for example, with the rain garden media, uh, because the iron grabs all the phosphate. <laughs> and so there's no phosphate for the plants to extract. Uh, and they, they take the, the iron, grabs the phosphate and turns it into uh, something that's on the surface of the, of the iron particle. It's no longer dissolved. And so the plants do not grow as well. They still grow, but not as well. So I, I would hold, uh, I'll hold my uh, opinion on that and um, see what happens in the future. So Katie, can I interrupt? This is Katie from CTS. We are just looking at the time and I think we should move to the panel. We don't want them to be shortchanged, but we can answer these questions maybe sprinkled in through the panel discussion. So. All right, sounds Great good. questions. Thank you for that. Yeah. Thank you for I'm those very questions. excited about all the interests too. Thank you very much, John, for your presentation and I'll pass it to Doug to facilitate the panel. Thank you, Katie. Um, let's see if we get everybody else to put themselves up on screen here as they get introduced. Um, we have four uh, panel members today. Uh, and I'll begin with a short introduction of each and then ask each of them to provide us with uh, a little bit of what their interest is with uh, green stormwater infrastructure or green infrastructure as we move along here. Um, the first person that I'll introduce is Ross Bittner, who is the division manager for the city of Edina engineering department. And his division plans and manages utility and water resource projects and provides right of way management, utility coordination, permitting and internal support services. Uh, Ross has been practicing uh, in city and consulting roles on municipal transportation and water resources projects for 20 years. He's an active member of the Minnesota APWA and currently serves on the Minnesota Stormwater Research Council. Uh, Mark Maloney will be on panel as well, and he's the uh, Director of Public Works for the City of Shoreview and directs public infrastructure planning, design, construction, maintenance, and asset management functions for the city. And Shoreview, Shoreview's Public Works Department is recognized for its pragmatic leadership and creative approaches to solving infrastructure challenges. And its operation and capital project uh, activities are continually rated high in community surveys. Uh, we also have Dwayne Stendlin with us today as a certified professional in erosion and sediment control and holds an adjunct teaching position at the University of Minnesota in the Department of Biosystems and Agricultural Engineering. He has worked in, his capacity, in this capacity for MnDOT for more than 24 years and is involved with design, construction, and maintenance using ecologically and sustainable based technologies to solve difficult soil and stormwater quality problems. And finally, we have Mike Trojan, uh, who is a hydrologist with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency Stormwater Program. And his primary responsibility uh, is maintaining, updating and disseminating, disseminating information uh, through the Minnesota Stormwater Manual. Um, so I'll start off real quick and just put Mike on the spot and say, Mike, one inch is measured how? It's 
one inch of rainfall over a 24 hour period on impervious surface or what do you, what do you want to call it? Um, my engineers will correct me, I'm sure, when we're done here, but <laughs> it's, a one, it's my understanding is a construction stormwater permit, it's one inch off impervious surface. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I, we want to give each of these folks an opportunity to kind of make an opening statement and we'll, we'll give Ross Bittner that the lead slot on that and uh, he can let us know what he's thinking about when he's thinking about green infrastructure and how that works with uh, managing his systems. Sure. Thanks for the invite, uh, Doug, and thanks for the introduction. Um, so is my role at a city organization. I like to think about uh, all the green infrastructure that we own as you know, doing good work to uh, that's going to provide valuable services to our residents and talking to our residents directly. I know that they really don't like getting flooded. I know they love wildlife, especially bumblebees and birds. Um, and they want their water bodies to be uh, probably cleaner than we can make them. Uh, really uh, clear swimming pool like uh, water bodies. Um, so most of the services we provide through uh, our stormwater infrastructure are about, you know, cleaning up the water um, and really accentuate, accentuating those uh, wildlife benefits. So happy to take part in this discussion and uh, share all the tips and tricks that I've come across to make the sales pitch to the public easier and give them a good view of what we provide at the city level. Thank you, Ross. Um, next, I'll invite uh, Mark to make a few statements. Well, thank you, Doug. And uh, because I think pictures will do better justice than uh, words, I'm going to ask Katie to share some images. Um, Shoreview started this um, movement towards green infrastructure uh, more than 10 years ago when we started um, looking at the use of permeable pavements as public infrastructure. And we were aware of uh, a lot of permeable pavement initiatives in the private sector, but we had uh, we're kind of out on the bleeding edge as far as using permeable pavements as public infrastructure. And, um, and Katie, I think if you could just back up one, one photo on my, yeah. I mean, this started in 2010, we built pervious concrete roadways over a mile of it. And it was the biggest project of its type globally in 2010 when we did this. And you can see in the lower right-hand corner, um, that is what pervious concrete looks like if it's subjected to, uh, aggressive de-icing chemicals. That wasn't the city's doing. That piece of uh, pavement was next to a high volume county arterial highway. And so it got uh, the effect of that. But um, next slide, please. A number of years later, we started to look at other permeable pavement technologies. And uh, I'm not a salesperson for any particular pro product, but uh, this was something that we did in 2014, a new way of thinking about a permeable pavement surface, again, as public infrastructure. Uh, we're not talking about parking lots or, or backyards or patio areas. We're, we're talking about public roadways. Uh, next slide. This particular product appro project approach had us using a, a precast concrete over a filter layer. Um, in 2014. And uh, this was uh, a part of a larger roadway project. The entire project wasn't built this way. This was uh, essentially a stormwater BMP in the middle of a project. Uh, next slide. This is just some other images of that same project area. This is in a completely developed residential area near a high value water body in the city of Shoreview. And so we actually had a tremendous public support for the effort to try to protect or improve water quality in the area. Next slide. A uh, couple of years later, some refinements to our technique. You can see that we are not using a gutter section. We're pouring just a vertical curb. And that's just to recognize that there's really no sense in trying to convey stormwater in a gutter when you're building a permeable pavement. Next slide. Other images from that same project area. And here again, you can see it's, it's in the middle of a normal roadway project where we're uh, identifying stormwater management BMP philosophy in, an, in a particular area. Uh, and you can deduce by the uh, photos that we're learning along the way with every one of these projects. Uh, next photo. This is the most recent uh, project that was completed last year in Shoreview. This is the first 
MSA collector roadway in the state of Minnesota that was approved for state gas tax funding to use this type of pavement approach. And so uh, we keep, I guess, moving the bar up a little bit in the community as far as what we're expecting or trying to accomplish with green infrastructure. Um, we understand that infiltration is really just one part of this discussion, but I just thought I'd give you some images to, um, to think about. And uh, for the, the inevitable question of what happens in the winter, uh, we purposely do not use any de-icing chemical or salts in our winter maintenance in these areas where we have permeable pavement. And you can see this is what it typically looks like in the winter. Um, and there's so much variability about winter road conditions in a city that's fully developed with heavy tree canopies and varying roadway widths that um, that's my way of saying, I don't think anyone notices the difference. So we're happy about that. Thank you, Katie. That's that's all I got. Thanks, Mark. Uh, next, I'll invite uh, Dwayne Stenland to share a few slides with us. Dwayne, I think you might Here. be muted. Okay, I bet now it might work. One screen or two? I've already used up all my minutes now, I'm sure. I only get three minutes, they tell me. Um, but you can hear me now, right, Doug? Yeah? Okay. Um, well, this is, I work for the Department of Transportation, been there for quite a few years, as you've heard. And this is Dwayne's view, but not necessarily the department's view. Um, I have a very different attitude. And I love my job, but it's a strange job sometimes to uh, make things happen. So there's lots of infrastructure. Minnesota DOT builds a lot of this stuff. So it's really a problem when you talk about vegetation, stormwater, natural resources, pavement, snow, safety. It's all infrastructure, just whether you call it blue, green, black, gray, orange, pink, whatever you want to call it. And I am going to use a definition that the EPA has used. I think it makes a difference. Um, it's supposed to be a cost-effective, resilient approach, and I think that's the neat part. And I'd recommend that the council consider getting Dr. Bonnie Keeler in. She gave one of the neatest presentations at the uh, Minnesota Shade Tree Short Course. And someone asked the question, what is one inch? Well, that's supposed to be 90 to 95% of all rains are to be captured on that first flush, instantaneous, kerplunked version of water. Uh, so the goal is that we can't treat all water, but we'd like to treat most of the water most of the time. But this has to do with the future and flooding. And if you look at what a six inch event might be, it's just an amazing amount of water that we're piling on some kind of a structure, green, gray, or you know, road kind of thing. It's just amazing to me, very good. And the part of the issue that she raised is that not all infrastructure, trees, water, are equally invested and maintained. And this has to do with what I'll call the, uh, the equity. And I'm using the word now stormwater equity we probably have not invested in some of the um, minority um, owned properties and areas in our cities. And I think that uh, there's a huge growth potential to use more green infrastructure. We ought to be in all areas treated equally, um, not just in the areas that are around lakes and all the green space, but the you know, parts of the cores of our city, including the suburbs. So I think the future is going to be using a lot more trees and shrubs with our ponds and rain gardens. So I can't even tell you what green infrastructure is exactly because Minnesota DOT is explored with solutions that are context, uh, that are designed. We've already heard LID, but we've got now complete streets, climate resiliency, sustainable, vibrant cities. I mean, it's just more words talking about the same thing. It's as if every time you fund something, I gotta have a new name for it or you won't fund it. And that's what it feels like to me. So we keep inventing things that I'm not sure we're really talking about anything different. So Minnesota has been working hard, in my opinion, to really try to preserve um, soil. I think all of this starts with the soil. Someone said, well, you don't really grow plants in clay, by the way. You get some roots in there, but it prefer to be in a nice fluffy thing. So soil is 50% solids and 50% pore space. Half of that is water, some of it is air. So if you have no pore space, it's not even soil. I'm glad I'm not a root, um, to tell you that, because this is the real issue. Soil is life. We don't think about soil and life, but in order to have green infrastructure, we need living soils that are adjacent to our ponds, in our basins, filtration and otherwise. And I think we're not doing a very good job preserving urban soils or actually any soil in America anymore. 
So the idea for me is multi-use green infrastructure. So we might call it complete streets from including people, drainage, um, and so on. So one of my favorite, I almost got it through at a MIMDOT project, is uh, this is from Calgary and they have a soccer field playground and it's a stormwater pond at the same time. Obviously you don't play on it, but for me, green infrastructure is doing more with less or I'm gonna always be less with less, but the idea, could I have a stormwater pond that is also a playground when that is so rare, particularly in the economically disadvantaged parts of our cities. Um, so I almost got a pond um, in, a, in, a, in a sport soccer field in the same spot. But of course, it's all about risk and money. Well, they'll be polluted. Well, actually, not like you think. So Minnesota has looked at a lot of green infrastructure. We continue to look at it. And green swales, bioswales, bioslopes, these are all the crazy things that I work on um, that I think are feasible. And it's using compost in a more sustainable manner. Uh, in fact, I'm using a lot of compost. And I think we should be doing using compost. And I want to give a plug into the city of Minneapolis of really making an effort to use compost um, that they generate instead of a landfill. And the other thing that's missing is that we don't know how to maintain what we build. John alluded to it, but we need real O&M manuals. We don't know where to put snow, but it comes down white, melts some icky color. And we put them in weird places and wonder why there are problems here. So I think we need to set aside money to maintain these things that so we I need. I mean, not just an operator, but a real manual, a real thing that tells us what to do, when to do it, how much is gonna cost, how many peoples I'm gonna to need to do it. Now we've got manuals, but nothing like this that would tell me how to maintain a bioinfiltration, a rain garden or whatever we're up to. And I really think we have adopt a road, adopt a landscape. And I think we should be looking at adopt a, a treatment facility. And this is an example of Virginia where I got a, a scan tour at the Virginia DOT, even though it's a landscaping, they're advertising, but at least they get it maintained. Um, so I think this green infrastructure problem is that we're trying to argue over the same space for visual quality, all sorts of things. So it's become a really big problem to try to make everybody happy in a world where no one seems happy anymore. But I think green infrastructure is how we make happy people is that trees, plants are just part of a, a human calming as well as a traffic calming experience. So that's Dwayne and I will certainly entertain all sorts of goofy questions and thank you for inviting me. Happy to have you always, Dwayne. I'm sure that uh, there will be plenty of questions for you. And Mike, uh, care to follow? So who was it that told Dwayne to unmute? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll be brief, hopefully. Um, so I do work for a, an organization, that, an agency that um, administers NPDES stormwater permits. But if you look at the permits, um, you won't see um, anything in them specific to green infrastructure. Obviously, we've been um, promoting infiltration, as um, John alluded to in his talk. Um, but you won't see language in there about green infrastructure. But another, another role that we have at the state is to provide guidance to stormwater practitioners and our permittees to help them. And um, if you go back way back to the original manual in 2005, it was one of the first manuals to bring in the concepts of low impact development. So it was ahead of the times. But now I think we're seeing that um, we need to move past that even. Sustainability is going to be the topic of the future. And I think that we're starting to, to pick up on that. And that's the theme that um, we're gonna start to introduce now over the, we started it now and we're gonna be seeing more and more of it over the next couple of years. I focus on the manual because that's what I work mostly on. Um, and so I'm just gonna briefly share my screen um, these are some of the um, key focal points that I think that we're going to be focusing in on. Um, we're already do, um, doing some of this, but you'll be seeing more of this, I think, in the future. Building systems that provide multiple benefits, um, not just stormwater, um, managing water quality, water volume, but improving habitat, sequestering carbon, and so forth. Um, John mentioned vegetation. Utilizing vegetation, we have a current work order to greatly expand information on vegetation in the manual. Integrating stormwater management with other functions such as transportation, utilities, and so forth. I think the term stack multiple benefits or something like that is, is something a term that you'll hear um, quite a bit. Um, green infrastructure, green stormwater infrastructure planning at a site, at a development site. What, um, how do you get started? What do you, what do, you do to begin with? Um, Dwayne mentioned O&M, we have an ongoing work order 
to improve O&M maintenance as it relates specifically to green infrastructure. Um, life cycle cost, Wayne also mentioned that. And I think one more thing that we've really overlooked and kind of missed the boat on is getting citizens to participate, public to um, involved in this too. We can't do everything by ourselves. Um, let's, let's, uh, we're starting to see new seed mixtures for lawns, for example. Um, let's uh, disconnect um, roofs and run that into um, individual rain gardens that people have on their properties. Let's start engaging and bringing the public into the picture too. So those are some of the things that I think you're going to be seeing us focus on in the future. Thanks for having me today. Thanks, Mike. Uh, well, you know, in listening to what uh, John talked about today and some other things, I, it it certainly brings to mind a couple things that we have to deal with at the watershed frequently um, related to green infrastructure. Uh, a primary concern at this point is how are all these things going to be maintained, maintained over time and are they being monitored uh, around their effectiveness um, once they are constructed. And just wondering how each of you in your own organizations are kind of looking at that um, uh, moving forward of, of how you're going to ensure and is it any different than the practices that you've been building for the last 40 years it just um, or not. Um, Mark, why don't you, can I get you to take a crack at that? Um, thank you, Doug. Um, I think our profession, if you think of public infrastructure managers, um, we're really good at just doing stuff in obscurity and quietly and just, um, it, it just isn't, I think, in the nature of a lot of this that are in this industry. And we've got to overcome that because all these things that we've been able to do in Shoreview, we've done with our city council, with our elected official and our citizen advisory committees, more or less right by our side. And um, not only is that just a more inclusive way of making decisions and building a community, but it gives you a cover for budgeting for correctly for the right amount of money in the future it's going to take to um, maintain this stuff. Because uh, you do have different maintenance protocols. You are going to be if these BMPs are going to be successful and sustainable in the future, the, you don't just build them and walk away. I, there's so much evidence from the NERP era of, and, and John touched on this in his presentation, we were really good at building drainage ponds. We were not so good about forecasting their future needs or having the organizational courage to stand up and say, these cost money and we have to pay for them. So our, our formula in Shoreview, the one that I'm familiar with has been um, to not do these things in obscurity, not do them necessarily for a whole lot of credit, but um, just make sure that these partnerships that you're building to get these things done are public and people know what's going on. Um, some people don't care, but uh, we're learning that an increasing number of people do care. Do you, do you have, um, are you looking at these things in terms of life, life cycle costing or as, is it more typical you look at a, a construction a design and construction cost and you really don't um, look at the life cycle cost of maintenance right up front? Well, for, for local governments in Minnesota, you know, the, there are different pots of money to build something and then take care of it. And uh, that's the organizational courage, I think, that, uh, that I'm trying to refer to is that it's sometimes a lot easier to find construction dollars than it is to find maintenance dollars. Uh, you know, we have, and so I, I think um, you've got to have, you, you really do need to have strong leadership in your organizations in order to have that courage to find the money. Go ahead, Ross. Doug, uh, where the city of Edina has seen some success on this, we've seen leadership uh, from our council level to set a clear strategic direction. Uh, so when I think about the, uh, the life cycle costs, the how to keep this thing going for the long term, our council set a, a strategic direction where they call, call it strong foundation. And to me, that really speaks to our asset management strategy, um, looking at things not just from the initial purchase, but for the full life cycle cost. Uh, we want to make sure that we're starting to get the, the purchase decision, uh, you know, squared in so that we know we can maintain it over the long term. And we haven't been great at that in the past. And we've seen uh, several areas of our operations where 
Um, we have you know, unfunded liability, uh, but slowly starting to address those and uh, putting the, the funding and the people in place to you know, continue to, to maintain those uh, valuable infrastructure. Um, it just starts with that strong foundation strategy that they've set. And then the other one is how do we make sure the things that we do build are well aligned with the values of the public? And for that, the council set a, a better together strategy where they uh, specifically describe how we're going to engage with the community uh, during the concept and design phases. Uh, so in that one, uh, if uh, participants want to look into an example that we're doing, uh, bettertogetheredina.org has got a variety of different projects, uh, capital and otherwise, where you can kind of see how we're uh, demonstrating that better together strategy. Thanks, Ross. Uh, Dwayne, anything to add with the uh, maintenance and, and how uh, perhaps MnDOT looks at these things? Well, we've got wonderful computer tools to help us on this, but the problem is, as I see it, is that we never set any side for the future maintenance. Everything seems to be in a just in time and most of the time kind of at a crisis management. You know, when it's, we don't have any way to, you might say that it's three quarter aged and start programming. It seems like it has to get much worse than that before we can you know, do something. So we love to build. So if you were to help me at all, we always have a ribbon cutting. We have all the politicians out there patting each other in the back how great we did to build a new bridge. But when have we actually had a ribbon cutting saying, maintenance, you did a great job this year and pat them on the back, cut a ribbon, have the news. You know, it's, you know, Mark already said we're on the silent zone and we don't give a lot of credit for the the complexity of maintaining the uh, green, you know, all the different colors of infrastructure that we have. Um, uh, it's just hard when we don't know what things cost. And that's my point is that if we were to buy a brand new snowplow truck, it comes with an operator's manual. We have people that know how to fix it. When you buy a brand new infiltration gallery, um, we built it, but I know people have all these manuals, but honestly, I've never seen one for that specific thing and it should have, where do you park? What equipment do you need? How many hours might it take per year and dollar cost average that if it goes 10 years, but we don't really have for each facility. So for every Ford truck sold, it come with an operator's manual. For every infiltration, they should have an operator's manual, even if they're replicated over and over again for the same thing. And that's the part that I see is that we don't know how to pay for the things we do. We find the money, but it seems always frustrating that it's coming from something else. Thank you. Um, I, I don't know, Mike, if you have anything to add to that discussion with, uh, in terms of maintenance, what your, the agency would be looking at? Um, I think as far as um, our, our guidance and so forth, that you are starting to see that we're developing, um, we're, we're incorporating O&M into our design phase now. So if you went to the, one of the more recent pages in the manual, which is infiltration, you went to the design section there, you would actually see a subsection on that page on um, designing for O&M, which I think is really important on the front end. Um, I don't know who it was, maybe Ross or Dwayne made the point that we built something and then we kind of go and figure out the O&M later. Um, I think we need to build that into the initial considerations at a site. Uh, one more thing, too, I think, is that we've learned an awful lot of lessons over the years about O&M, and I think we need to really start incorporating those. John talked a lot about soils. We need better information about how to treat our soils, for example, um, to try to prevent a lot of the problems that John was alluding to. Yep. Um, I think we have a question from uh, one of our audience members. Uh, Katie, could you... Sure, um, Polly, you had your hand raised and you can go ahead and unmute and ask a question or provide a comment if you wish. Oh, apologies guys, that was definitely not my intention. <laughs> but I've been peppering the chat with some uh, great resources from San Francisco. They made a maintenance model to kind of get at what I think you were talking, Dwayne, Dwayne looking at you know dollar per square foot if, if your infrastructure is clustered together spread apart how many hours is it going to take and how does that translate into FTEs um, so getting in folks with folks there with um, could be could be something to think about 
That's great, Polly. I uh, actually will be looking at that because <laughs> we're looking at that question right now, what the cost is gonna be or how many staff members we would need if we take on more maintenance uh, during our projects. Um, if I can just real it, mention real quickly, Doug, I had mentioned that infiltration yep. section in the manual and it does have that information for infiltration practices. So that's the kind of thing I think we need to start incorporating. Yep, great, great. Um, Let's see where some of my other. And John, Doug, what I'm looking for is the idea we have standard details for silt fence, standard details for blanket. Um, an, an awful lot of the ponds, while they're not standards, would be a value that I could, you could build a, a maintenance manual based on, you might say, plug and run details, narratives um, that are built based on what we did build, but it's not trying to rewrite a manual every time. Um, no one's got the time for that. It'd, be, it'd still be valuable to know an awful lot more than we're providing. And I know that New York um, and Nebraska have really nice maintenance manuals for um, their road infrastructure. They're cartoon based, but they're quite interesting. Um, part of their MS4 program. Hmm. It's good to know. Is um, I think one of the one of the things that we also are, are we bump up to uh, sometimes when trying to design or get green infrastructure on the land is that the current land development process, whether that's a transportation led or a parcel uh, being developed is that stormwater tends to come at the end of the process. Um, any thoughts on how we might uh, get our systems that we're trying to design and build here considered earlier in that design process so that we can have better options uh, on the table rather than trying to shoehorn something in at the end. And I see Ross had his hand up. Yeah, that's that's my job. Uh, so as an engineer, um, we're often seeing new development or redevelopment come in the door. Um, and during the entitlement process, uh, during the, the permit checks, um, we're making sure that uh, the systems approach is really taken. Um, so oftentimes uh, people are backing into um, stormwater uh, systems uh, through regulatory requirements, but they often don't uh, have a partner on the city side that's saying, here's how we're gonna you know, take your runoff. Here's how our system that's already overburdened might affect yours. And I think those type of discussions early on in the development process, um, and especially on projects that have um, more latitude, you know, the bigger commercial redevelopment or, uh, you know, longer um, or larger uh, linear projects, you've got the chance early on, but it often means that you have to be responsive and have some other uh, funding sources that can react because usually it's not always the developer's problem um, or the project applicant's problem. You have some existing infrastructure that's, uh, you essentially treat that project as an opportunity. Um, so I think that's really about understanding your systems as systems and figuring out, you know, the best way to catch that, uh, that, that development as it's coming in. So are you, uh, are you then uh, at a, your local level, you're, you're developing kind of a, a, a watershed or a district or a pipe shed system approach. And then as people uh, develop a lot within that drainage area, you're looking at it system wide, not just as an individual parcel next to an individual parcel. Right. Uh, before uh, something came in, it would often, you know, there'd be a lot of assumptions about like, you know, just free discharge. Um, free discharge isn't a thing anymore in our city because uh, we have a fully modeled system and we know that, you know, uh, no tail water is just a, an illusion. Um, a first ring suburb, the, the flooding issues are everywhere. And we usually start uh, thinking about it in terms of that flooding issue. And a lot of developers have in their mind, you know, that suburban mindset where uh, my water has the right of way in the pipe and it can just freely outfall. Well, that's not the yeah. case. And if you fill in a low area or if you expect your, uh, your pipe to flow full in the top of the hundred year event, it just doesn't. So we give them specific hydrologic information of the network that they're networking into. And then uh, we essentially just lead with those constraints and make them part of the design. Sure. Um, uh, 
Katie, we have another person with a hand up. Could I re add to that a little bit? Um, Doug, I think things are going to change a little bit, and it's called visual quality uh, manuals uh, that MnDOT is part of our um, early project assessment. So instead of a stormwater pond being a nuisance or a green garden to be a nuisance, suppose it was an amenity that how we would green and include people and make them not afraid of water anymore. So if it's part of a tree system, so I don't think ponds have to be tree free, but if we were to incorporate these features right at the very beginning that are also calming, traffic calming, uh, visual pleasing, and they're also stormwater, I don't think this is gonna be a hard sell if I could get more than one function, ecological service out of trees, water, um, and people. I agree entirely. <laughs> Preaching to the choir on that one. Uh, Katie? Yes, we have um, Margarita Pryor, a participant who would like to ask a question. Go ahead, Margarita. Yeah, hi, thanks. Uh, um, and I, I have to say, I, I'm with EPA and I, uh, I love you, Duane. I love what you're saying, so thank you. Um, but what I wanted to note was, and I'm sure that uh, Minnesota has already gotten the information, which is that EPA is sending out uh, a needs survey. We're finally doing it. And non-point source is expected to be a significant part of the survey this time around, which it typically gets ignored. And we need to recognize that stormwater is not the only non-point source that's out there. And so there are many ways of integrating these efforts so that, uh, and we use the, the sort of the um, power of the SRF funding that's out there to do things differently than we have done before. So I would just urge you when you get the survey uh, that you really put in a plug for all of the things that you've just been discussing now. That's it. There we go. I had to turn myself back on. Thank you for that, Margarita. Um, does, well, I know Dwayne would always have something to say if I opened it up to him, but I think rather than just doing the open up thing, um, there's been some discussion around how of systems here and how to integrate uh, urban systems in a way that's more uh, effective and efficient for all those systems. Does anybody or have has anybody kind of developed a measurement uh, thing for that? So are you looking at um, social, economic, environmental measures of those integrated systems in a way that you can then report back your success or failure to the projects that you do? And again, I saw Ross with a raised hand, so I'll let him start. Yeah, we're trying that a little bit, but we haven't had a lot of success. Um, one one uh, rating system that we've been really interested in is the Envision rating system that um, tries to look a little bit more holistically about sustainability and carbon. Um, but we ha we've only benchmarked a few of our uh, infrastructure projects against it. We've never actually looked to uh, score ourselves. Um, so I'd say if you're looking for a good model to, to kind of get a sense for, uh, start there. And then um, we've started to include some of those performance metrics in a few of our land use plans and our comp plan. Um, and we're doing a climate action plan right now where we're hoping to get a little bit more holistic about sustainability and really apply that thinking to our stormwater lens as we work through that planning process. But really, it's going to be about what uh, people in Edina want, um, and we're going to try to tailor it to uh, the specific concerns that are addressed through that engagement. Great. Thanks. Anybody else on the panel have something along those lines? Or Well, I want to say thanks to the Minnesota um, Stormwater Research Council, um, because part of what you're asking about is the soft engineering, the soft side that don't have, it's a touchy feely thing and it's hard to put a number on it. I can tell you how much right. rebar costs. I can tell you how much compacted soil costs, but it's hard to gauge feelings. Um, and these are the soft sides. So fortunately the 
Um, some of the money now is being spent on that kind of a, a different kind of engineering to gather some of the data that was just re referenced. Um, and I think we've got a long ways to go to say that that looks good or doesn't look good because I can't give you an instant tree. So here's the question for the audience. How many years does it take to grow a hundred year old oak tree? You see, <laughs> but you want it in one year. Yeah. Yep, too true. Um, well, I think uh, we have coming up a round robin here where we can continue to have folks um, ask questions of all the participants. Um, if you want to submit a question, and I think I'll uh, have Christy step in here and we can kind of help see if there's any interest uh, from folks. Or we could go back to the other questions that were previously asked and not answered, I guess, too. Yeah, I think there's a few more questions in the Q&A. Um, so one was, can you share more about how that soccer field pond work, pond works, or can you share a link to that example? So I think that's for Dwayne. Um, well, I can show you the photographs and I have physically walked the soccer field. It's a multi soccer field area and it's how the city of Calgary um, was dealing with their flood control and stormwater management. So you can see that there's a concrete flume ring so in low flows, it never even basically gets to the grass and you can play soccer and all your recreational things and they have little bridges, but apparently in Canada, they don't have as many lawyers um, <laughs> so that they're freely able to play on these things. Uh, and most of the pollutants um, are mitigated through the turf grass. So it's, it's a very large field for flood and for stormwater, but they made another use out of it. So as an example, we build a lot of stormwater ponds and the answer another question is I can't grow plants on an iron and hand sand filter if my life depended on it, can't do it. But it would be interesting to grow plants again that have multiple use where you're not gonna harm a child if they you know, play on it, but this is designed for high infiltration. So it's really kind of fascinating that it grows the plants that you play on. They might even harvest water and irrigate it. Um, and in the end, you still get a good looking turf. So I was there in the winter, that's why I look all gray and brown, I can show you share with you the photos if you're interested. But to me, it's just creativity. Let's not be stuck in a, in a stormwater box where we couldn't include other environmental services or ecological services. Yes, there could still be back slopes with butterflies and a place to play. Mm -hmm. And then we had one more question. Is there guidance on how to incorporate trees without creating the sheltering issue that Professor Gulliver discussed? Any thoughts uh, on any, that? Anything, yeah. Do you want me to answer that one? Sure, uh, there, John. Are, there are ideas. Um, that we're not even close to guidance. We have ideas that we're going to, that we're currently in the process of researching. And one idea is to cut down pathways through the trees uh, and then you could plant some uh, uh, some habitat for butterflies and things like that in there. And so that the public doesn't get real upset about the trees disappearing. You plant some paths, uh, cut some pathways through there and let the wind through. Um, the pathway, it seems to be successful on the computer, but we haven't really tried it in reality. Could you say something, John, about the fetch or the orientation of a basin? You know, it might be two times longer than wide. Doesn't that affect too which solar aspect a basin is? Um, it, it, of course, it does. But these basins are so uh, the ba most of the basins that we've seen, most of the ponds we've seen, are so highly sheltered that it doesn't really seem to make much difference. It might make a difference when you start cutting pathways through the trees, however. Uh, we I haven't think, researched that yet. Uh, the, the wind just doesn't get down to the water. It's just way above, you know, we have a 40-foot tree and you have a 50 times 40 foot is the length of the separation zone. And so, you know, the wind just never, you, 50 times 40 is pretty big. That's 800 feet or 1,000 feet. As far as existing ponds go, John's right. There isn't a lot we can do with them. We can cut paths and so forth. If you're talking about phosphorus management for new ponds, I think 
we don't have we got to develop new guidelines for that new new design specs um it's it's something that we didn't think about 30 years ago when we built the original design specs for those so katie it looks like um jeff bush has his hand up if you can unmute him yes jeff you can um, i've unmuted you go ahead I must have, I must have bumped it. Uh, wonderful presentation, but I must have bumped it. I, I don't, I didn't try to hit that. Oh. <laughs> um, so we do have another question on equity. So what is your advice to address stormwater equity from a regional perspective, specifically when stormwater assets are managed and maintained differently by each local government? Sure, they'd have to ask a really hard question. Um, uh, can I talk to you about how to land a lunar module on Mars? <laughs> <laughs> Might be easier. The, the, I think the first step, and that's all I'm at, is the idea of recognizing that there might be um, inequity on how we've cited stormwater um, traditionally in our urban areas. You know, whether it's a MnDOT road in a city or a city road in a city, I don't think we've really looked at um, in the same way of where trees go, shrubs go, or the maintenance dollars that we would assign in um, in a rich area or a poor area in terms of the economics of what's around us. We do know based on the work that was done um, at the Humphrey Institute, and she did a wonderful job. She did a GIS overlay and looked at where the trees are, where the stormwater is, where the parks are, and where the poor people are, you know, and minorities and so on. And she found a disparity um, a real disparity between your know, trees, maintenance, and you know where people live. And I thought it was extremely fascinating. And I had never thought about stormwater equity before and making sure that the, the SWIPs are, are, are proper. And in fact, the MPCA just had a report on environmental justice and even how we administer our, our stormwater program during construction is different based on where the project is located. And that just it really blew my mind. I had no idea that somehow uh, environmental justice, even if it's not a first thought, it's somehow entering into what we do. And I was, and I, and I, 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 the data is real. Uh, City of Edina's recently had a race and equity initiative and a report, but they didn't identify anything specific to stormwater. Although the uh, better together uh, strategy that our council has put out uh, to engage the community specifically talks about, uh, you know, trying to make sure everyone is at the table and has an equal voice. Um, so what that looks like, um, you know, generally people who are uh, close to our projects or uh, feel like they have a voice at the table, uh, we'll hear from them. Uh, but how do you go out and intercept people and uh, get others into the into the you know, process and aware of what's going on. Oh, well, uh, it takes a variety of different um, techniques. And I think the leading practice organization that we used to uh, create our Better Together strategy was the International Association for Public Participation. And they're found at iap2.org. And they have some good recommendations for uh, how, to, how to get a variety of voices from the community into the conversation around you know what you're choosing to build or uh, policy questions that the city is looking at. Dwayne, Dwayne had mentioned the study that the PCA put out and I, I'm not part of this group but there is a small group in the stormwater section there that is looking at these issues and it's a it's an it's a fairly new topic and like Dwayne said I think it's maybe a little surprising to or maybe it shouldn't be surprising to some of us some of the results that we're finding but um, feel free to contact me if you'd like more information on that effort at the agency. We also have a number of people, I think, on the in, attending today from Met Council, and they've done um, an extensive mapping on flooding and um, transportation or transit systems. And it seems like the underserved areas are also the areas that are prone to flooding. So it's kind of an, an irony that we're trying to maintain a safe and efficient transportation system, but it's a lot of our systems are probably subject to flooding. So when John talked about the opportunity 
that maybe a little infiltration won't make a lot of difference, but over time, as we build little areas like we did along the University Avenue, the central quarter light rail, so the stormwater and the sidewalk and the trees are all integrated. And today you wouldn't even know that that's part of the stormwater treatment system. It just looks like a boulevard with a road and some transit stuff on there and some trees and some grass, but it's actually way more than what it appears. Thank you, panelists. That was a great conversation. Um, as we tr transition to the round robin, if you have any announcements for your organization that you want to share with the group here or any ideas for future topics or maybe taking a deeper dive into what we talked about today, um, you can write it in the chat or raise your hand and we can unmute you. I did have one more question for Mark on the pervious pavement. I was kind of curious um, what kind of maintenance you have to do to perhaps clean out the joints. And then if you had any feedback from the community on noise concerns or bicyclist, bicyclist concerns driving on with all those joints. I was kind of curious about that. Um, well, thank you, Christy. Um, I'll see if I can remember uh, three things that you asked. Um, on the noise, um, most of the installations of our permeable pavements, at least that uh, in integrated concrete block system, have been on really low volume kind of quiet residential settings. And so, you know, we're talking traffic between 10 and 15 miles an hour in really quiet secluded neighborhoods. And so we've had really zero feedback in those situations about noise or you know, peculiarities of the surface for bicyclists. Um, we're probably gonna learn something on the, on the project that we just built now on a more high volume roadway. That roadway has an ADT of over two to 3000, which makes it a fairly busy roadway in our community. Um, there are separate off street pedestrian facilities that, you know, some recreational bicyclists use, but um, um, we'll have yet to hear from the commuter biking community on that, on the surface type. I don't expect to hear too much, um, but uh, haven't heard anything. Um, we vacuum sweep our streets in the Shoreview, whether they're impermeable, uh, regular asphalt roads perme or permeable pavements. We have a very, very aggressive street sweeping program. And so we have mechanical brush sweepers that we use on our normal pavements, and we exclusively air sweep vacuum sweep our permeable pavement sections. And so um, we were already committed to that sort of um, tandem approach to sweeping in the community for water quality reasons, for fine particle pickup. And so um, that's, it's, it's really more or less fallen into our maintenance regime. Uh, we don't, uh, if, if we know that a lot of organic material has fallen off the trees because of a storm, we may send our air sweepers out um, to those permeable pavement areas, but um, we don't do anything special to clean the joints out unless we've had a landscaping disaster where a bunch of black dirt washed down the road or something like that. So we have about six minutes. It looks like a couple or one more question might have came in. So some of the panel recommended a highly vegetated rain garden in order to maintain and promote higher level of infiltration, saturated conductivity. Such practices are more difficult to maintain compared to a grass covered basin that can just be mowed and is thus easier to maintain, but would not promote as much diversity in habitat. Is there recommended optimal planting design where both, ob both obje objectives can be met? I think that's something that we're working on with our vegetation work order that's ongoing. And I should also note that there are native grasses that do send down pretty deep root systems. So we can focus on those perhaps. I think that's a great question, by the way. And uh, just like people have a choice to buy uh, perhaps 100 models of cars, you not all stormwater ponds have to look the same. The city of Maplewood had a wonderful guide for 
a shrub garden, a turf grass garden, um, a butterfly garden, and that still exists. And so that you can actually have a stormwater pond with diversity, but be simple at the same time. So it's plugs. You could have three species of native plants and leave gaps in them. It could be a rock mulch, you know, as a gap so that you know what you want. And if it don't look like that, pull it. So instead of mowing, in fact, I would argue that, you know, the goal should be to stop mowing. There's talk that one hour of mowing is about a hundred cars. So it's possible we could have a different kind of a, of a maintenance regime that doesn't include grass, but don't forget that grass is still better than just a street curb gutter and river for discharge, you know, as a, as a place to filter. So I think it's just a matter of choice and pick the level that you can maintain as opposed to not doing anything at all. So if all you can do is mold then pick a moldable version. But if there's some that can pick some weeds and that's why I was promoting, by the way, the idea of adopt a rain garden because it takes labor and we're never gonna have city and uh, public staff to do it if we don't have what Ross called, you know, we're all in it together or we're better together you know, kind of thing. And I really think that's the key is to get more public involvement. So. If, you want simple, build simple, but we can go as complex as you have a budget for. I believe that the higher the diversity, the better, but that doesn't mean simple doesn't work. So Michael Kelly has his hand raised. Hey, go ahead, Michael, we've unmuted you. Yeah, okay, go ahead. Um, I've basically retired now, but I was involved in the stormwater management stuff when we did it at Raybine quite a bit. And we were moving a lot of water off of hard surfaces into just sand profiles. And those sand profiles can be either modified to allow it to drain off immediately or to store some of a storm on the water and then re release it slowly, which is a lot of the effect that we have in problems with stormwater is the surge effect that's there. Also, all of the silts and the stuff are going directly into the storm sewers instead of going into the turf and accumulating on top of the turf and then going out to the stormwater. And I agree with Duane in the fact that there are a number of grass species out there. I actually do some grass sales for Twin City Seed too. And uh, at Raybines, we had a sod farm, so I pretty well backed on the vegetation part of it. And if you put in fescues versus Kentucky bluegrass, you're going to have a significantly different root system, um, which will, like John said earlier in the thing, if there's a root there, there's a pore space that the water is going to fall through. And the key to getting depth, depth of growth is not only the water, but how far can the air go? And that's why I think sand is such a, an important part of your sand iron systems and so forth, because you're talking about getting air down to, you know, 14 inches down or something of the kind, and you want that to be a capacity that that, that system has. The other thing is, I guess, on the standards for soil, we're also talking about what is the standards of the soils that we use. And in order to get number A soil, I think it's like 85% to 15% silt. Those two won't mix and make the same kind of components every time. Thank you, Michael. Um, does anybody have any comments on that? Otherwise, we're approaching 4.30. So I just wanted to thank our speakers today, John Gulliver, Mark Maloney, Ross Bittner, Dwayne Stenland, and Mike Trojan. I think we had a great conversation. And I hope everybody has a nice evening. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today.